All right, well, we are at two o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our May, I cannot believe we are in May, maternal webinar focusing on pulmonary hypertension and pregnancy. Um, this is our seventh lecture in our cardiac education series. Um, we do plan to have a Q&A session at the end of the webinar, um, but you can add your questions into the chat at any time. Um, the presentation and recording will be available on our website at www.georgiapqc.org, um, as well as we'll post this on MS Teams for our our hospitals that have access. Um, if everyone could just please mute their lines to avoid any distractions, that would be great. And we don't have that many updates, but um, we did uh, want to share that we have our final lecture of this educational series on June 6th. The topic will be OB anesthesia and LND considerations with Dr. Johnson. Um, for our hypertension facilities, you did receive my email a few weeks back, the quarter one, and that should say 2023 hypertension data submission is due now. Um, and our quarter one 2023 cardiac data su submission is due May 15th. We gave hospitals a few additional weeks just because we're still finishing up our onboarding calls and wanna make sure you all have time to just start building you know, the, the metric system for your facility um, for those cardiac hospitals. And then um, we are planning on creating some sustainability surveys. Um, so within the next month or so, we're, we're going to be disseminating um, one to check on our maternal hemorrhage sustainability efforts um, and to assess any education needs there. And the other is to assess readiness to move the severe hypertension and pregnancy initiative into sustainability. So I think we've been talking about this for quite some time. There's been a natural alignment with um, our severe hypertension initiative and our cardiac initiative. And so we've kind of aligned that as, but I think it's time we now um, take a look and see where we are um, in terms of readiness for sustainability. Um, and in all QI initiatives, thinking about sustainability has to really happen at the start of any initiative. So as we get um, going with our cardiac initiative um, this year, it's really important to think about um, you know, hardwiring processes and systems for um, that long haul planning. Um, last month, I did showcase this. Um, AIM has updated their website, so there are some simulation and drills for um, that they have updated here, and the, the website is definitely going through a little bit of a redesign, um, but there's definitely some opportunities here for your teams to assess some education. I know that a lot of folks um, did use the AIM modules, um, and I do not believe they are up now. They were outdated, and they were re, re uh, updating those modules, and I know those were used for, for education. So there are some tools that have been posted there, and I, I um, encourage you to check those out. And then um, here is our key driver diagram. For most of you have seen this, we're kind of reviewing this on every webinar, but this is our key driver diagram for maternal cardiac conditions. Um, our goal is to re reduce severe morbidity and mortality related to maternal cardiac conditions in Georgia. We have a, a lofty aim by February 6, 2026, National Wear Red Day, to reduce harm related to existing pregnancy-related cardiac conditions through the fourth trimester by 20%. Um, and we have our process measures here um, in the uh, reporting and systems learning, and then all of them in bold are structure measures that um, our teams will be reporting on. All right, so I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Krishna to do our formal introduction to our wonderful speaker today. Thank you, Lisa. Um, it's my distinct pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Dr. Joel Hardin. He is the medical director for the Emory Adult Congenital Heart Center. Prior to his recruitment to Emory in 2022, he was the medical director for the Tampa Bay Adult Congenital Heart Center. He's board certified in adult congenital heart disease and pediatric cardiology and focuses his clinical interest on the cardiovascular risk associated with pregnancy among women with congenital heart disease. In addition to his civilian career, Dr. Hardin is a veteran of active duty military service with the 1st Marine Division during its 2004 deployment to Iraq. He separated from the Naval Service in 2006 at the rank of commander. Um, you know, I've recently, like we said, Dr. Hardin joined us in 2022, and he really has been very helpful and, and instrumental in expanding the, our Emory Adult Congenital Heart Center and pregnancy program. So we look very much forward to his lecture today. Great. Well, I hope uh, we are now sharing and uh, you can tell me if it's visible. Are you good to go there? Yeah, to go. I can see your lecture still. Yeah. 
Perfect. All right. Very good. Well, thanks for having me. I, I'm glad to meet many of you virtually and uh, and look forward to the chance to meet you face to face. Um, I uh, really do enjoy my time here in Atlanta so far. I will say that uh, compared to Tampa Bay, uh, the complexity level has escalated. So you guys deal with some really, really sick patients, um, challenging patients, but uh, you know, I think we are ready and willing to step up to those challenges. And uh, hopefully today we'll learn a little bit about pulmonary hypertension. I'll preface by saying I focus most of my attention in pulmonary hypertension in the uh, con congenital population, not those that have other forms of pulmonary hypertension. But I think it's worth uh, at least touching on some of those non-congenital pulmonary hypertension scenarios. And, uh, and I'll start off um, by telling you I have no uh, pertinent disclosures and uh, discuss what we're going to talk about today. So There'll be a clinical presentation I'll show you at the beginning and we'll come back to at the end. Um, and then I'll shift gears into the 2022 guidelines for pulmonary arterial hypertension evaluation and management that are most recently rewritten by our European colleagues. Uh, so as you know, many of the things that we do are kind of tales of two uh, sides of the Atlantic in terms of major guideline revisions. And um, the ones that are most recent are from Europe. And, and I think they are well-written and they pattern uh, very closely to how uh, those of us over here in the States practice and thought, I, thought I'd share them with you. Uh, I think they're also very, um, uh, I guess, condensed compared to some previous versions of these guidelines. So if you ever want to see them, uh, uh, the citations will be at the bottom of some of my slides. Uh, after we review the guidelines for evaluating uh, people with pulmonary hypertension, then we'll kind of focus on pregnancy and contraception and uh, uh, some of the postpartum concerns that I'm sure you guys are here to learn about, and then we'll get back to our clinical case, go over a few uh, questions about that case, let you think about them, and uh, and then we'll collectively make our plan. So without further delay, let's get into that case. So this, because I know uh, congenital heart disease, I picked congenital heart disease as the case. It doesn't have to be, uh, obviously, a woman with a birth defect of the heart, but uh, this is a pretty, actually pretty common situation because you're going to learn in, in a minute that women with other forms of pulmonary hypertension not due to congenital heart disease, they're usually older and they're not in the reproductive age. So this is a very germane population to talk about. She's 30 years old, has a large unrepaired ventricular septal defect, uh, a new patient to you and I, and she's on no meds, no prior known pregnancies. She tells us that she's fine at rest and with ordinary uh, daily activity about the house and at work, but when she's uh, looking back over her whole life, she's never been able to run or do anything more strenuous without being rapidly short of breath compared to her peers. Uh, no chest pain, arrhythmias, fainting, or coughing up of blood. Um, on exam, other than her oxygen saturation and nail bed clubbing, she looks pretty good. She's you know got normal blood pressure. She's not overweight. And uh, and when uh, you uh, get into why she's there in the office today, she tells you it's because she's not only needing a congenital heart specialist, but she's also just found out she thinks she's pregnant. And uh, uh, through an obstetrical consultation, uh, it has now been confirmed and she wants our collective multidisciplinary advice. So we'll come back to her in a minute, but we'll start with some background. So the key points from uh, the newest guidelines in 2022 are a slight redefinition of what is pulmonary hypertension um, at rest in the op in the office, uh, for example, when we estimate the pulmonary artery systolic pressure to be um, actually made the mean pulmonary pressure to be above 20, um, uh, that now meets criteria. Uh, I think uh, earlier guidelines might have raised that level a little higher to 25, but uh, we're certainly seeing reasons to categorize pulmonary hypertension at a lower level. Um, maybe pre-symptomatic, but still gives you a, a, a little earlier opportunity to treat and reverse diseases that could be contributing. Um, now, pulmonary hypertension means exactly that. The pressures in the pulmonary uh, sy system are high, but you might imagine there's really two components or two compartments. There's the arterial compartment leaving the right-sided chambers, and then there's the venous compartment delivering the blood from the lungs to the left heart chambers. If you just have arterial hypertension, but the left-sided venous pressures or filling pressures are normal, that's the technical definition of pulmonary arterial hypertension. Now, you may see us use these terms interchangeably, and, and for practical purposes, the young population of women in childbearing years almost always has the arterial side of hypertension, pulmonary hypertension, and they're not usually coming to you in heart failure 
as the primary reason for their disease. So uh, for practical purposes, we're talking about pulmonary arterial or PAH and and the definition of wedge pressures or filling pressures on the left side is, is shown there. So it's uh, 15 or less. Um, and uh, I think we're going to hopefully convey to you today that the algorithm for defining pulmonary hypertension is a little simpler than it used to be. Um, it's a clinical suspicion based on what they're telling you, symptoms and signs. Um, uh, echocardiography is your frontline investigation. And then confirmation by uh, cardiac catheterization, usually and preferentially in a center where pulmonary hypertension specialists are uh, prevalent. So um, uh, for the next two key points, exactly what we're here to talk about. Um, women with pulmonary hypertension become pregnant or uh, present during pregnancy. Um, and if possible, um, they should be treated in centers with multidisciplinary teams experienced in managing this somewhat complex uh, uh, population of patients. Uh, this is no surprise to anything I'm sure you've talked about throughout the rest of the webinars that in the highest risk category of patients, unfortunately, the physician and other multidisciplinary team member um, numbers are just not there. Uh, you, you may not know this, but in, in the United States, there's just around 500 adult congenital cardiologists. That's nowhere near what the population needs. But unfortunately, uh, we are geographically um, limited to the large uh, academic centers and major metropolitan medical centers. Uh, we also want to you know, come back to this at the end of the talk, but many of your patients with pulmonary hypertension who become pregnant are potentially already taking medications that are uh, very um, dangerous for the fetus, and and it be pref it's preferred that they be off these medications even before they start trying, or maybe uh, put themselves into a situation where they're trying but could become pregnant. Um, but there are meds that we can use to help lower pulmonary arterial pressures and stabilize the more symptomatic patient, even during pregnancy, um, short of those uh, those two classes of meds, including phosphodiesterase inhibitors, the, like the tadalafils and sildenafils, calcium channel blockers, very commonly used for hypertension in general, and even some of the more exotic prostacycline analogs that are available either inhaled, IV, or subcutaneous. Uh, they've all been used safely during pregnancy. Now. Um, Sort of what I've kind of alluded to at the beginning, there are many different types of pulmonary hypertension. The WHO uh, categorization groups one through five recently revised includes um, examples on this slide of each of those types. So in the group one, this is where most of our women of childbearing age live. They are those that have idiopathic pulmonary hypertension. These are actually fairly sick people. Uh, they don't have congenital heart disease. They have perhaps a genetic trait that predisposes them to poor arteriolar uh, relaxation. They they could have um, other forms of connective tissue disorders. They can even have, like my patient population, many forms of congenital heart disease. So that's a very large uh, subset of women who are going to want to know about their hazards for pregnancy. Uh, related to pregnancy um, in uh, childbearing years. Now, the group two population is people like me, old guys, you know, old women. <laughs> They're the ones that have heart failure, uh, filling pressures on the left side are high because of chronic hypertensive heart disease, ischemic heart disease, you name it. This is not the group that you're likely to see becoming pregnant, although obviously there are women who get pregnant later in life or who have heart diseases that emerge in their childhood or young adulthood that can pre predispose them to heart failure with uh, reduced or preserved ejection fractions. Um, uh, prevalent throughout all age groups are lung causes of pulmonary hypertension, COPD, interstitial lung disease, either primary or secondary, obstructive sleep apnea. Um, and you can tell some of the slides are from the European side, so uh, notice the spelling. All right. And then uh, a very um, uh, important subgroup, group four, it has its own its singular diagnosis, and that's the chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension category. These individuals, um, without having a single, uh, um, you know, it's not like they have a single pulmonary embolism event. They shower their lungs with pulmonary emboli from one reason for one reason or another over you know many many years, and and it just does a number on the uh, small blood vessels in the lungs, and it gradually accrues significant arteriolar obstruction. Uh, very very difficult patient population, and then group five is kind of the catch all for everything else. Uh, m multiple causes that I haven't listed that uh, you may hear about um, in you know, pulmonary medicine clinics. That, again, probably not a significant number of people coming to uh, pregnancy decisions in group five, but uh, it is it is something that 
uh, throws another layer of complexity into our uh, management. All right, so the epidemiology and risk factors for pulmonary hypertension, well, all age groups are affected from babies until uh, the elderly, um, about 1% of the total population. Similarly, 1% of the total population has congenital heart disease. Not everybody has pulmonary hypertension, though. They don't overlap. Uh, uh, and then as far as the uh, uh, most common causes, uh, already alluded to, cardiac you know, heart failure um, and uh, things like sleep apnea, emphysema and such that are prevalent in older people. Um, so uh, not belabor belaboring that point, we'll move right on to um, how you might go about diagnosing someone or suspecting the diagnosis of someone who's presenting uh, unknown to you, uh, perhaps, and you want to know what can I look for that might clue me into um, pulmonary hypertension as, a, as an underlying problem. So we're going to talk a little bit about the frontline uh, examinations done in the office by primary care physicians, obstetricians, and general cardiovascular internists. Um, when suspicion for heart disease is the cause, then you'll sort of track down a, a side of this algorithm that moves quickly to echocardiography. If you're suspecting other pulmonary causes, you might look for, you know, you know, uh, emphysema, chronic, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease by doing PFTs, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, depends on what your initial suspicion is. You can always cross over, though. I mean, if you if you, you know, your suspicion is heart disease, turns out the echo is fine. You you can easily obviously uh, redirect your attention elsewhere. Um, when you're uh, suspecting. Uh, pulmonary hypertension, and then there's uh, a high probability based on some of the early screening tests that you've ordered, um, then it's time to refer right into a comprehensive center for pulmonary hypertension or to a specialist in your uh, neck of the woods that has a special interest in uh, further evaluating these possibilities. And one point I'll make is that uh, when you identify the chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension patient, that is unfortunately the patient that's almost um, the the most, if you will, orphaned from the medical system in the sense that there's not too many people that really specialize in that, and especially who specialize in treating that. So, um, so uh, if you get one of those patients, they quickly need to find a, a center of excellence for uh, CTEP. All right. Um, now, symptoms. The early symptoms uh, that you're gonna, you know, kind of, I mean, almost universal is uh, a woman who says. You know, I'm fine at rest, but when I exert myself even beyond just ordinary daily activity, I get short of breath and nobody like me, my age looking like me, gets that. And so they're they're really, that's their primary, almost a universal chief complaint. That leads to, you know, premature um, you know, cessation of exercise and activities. And um, and there's an interesting phenomenon. I love the, 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 the authors of this uh, uh, guideline, they, they mentioned something called bend apnea. When you bend over, you get short of breath. When you're upright, you're not so short of breath. So you, you can elicit that maybe by history. Um, many of the people that have pulmonary hypertension and secondarily, they have right ventricular dysfunction or right ventricular hypertension, they'll get superimposed arrhythmias and uh, and they could be any kind of arrhythmia. So it can be palpitations due to ectopy or it can be more sustained arrhythmias, uh, atrial tachycardias, AFib and uh, ventricular arrhythmias. Um, more uh, other things that you might hear them say is that they're just prone to being very vulnerable to weight gain, especially abdominal distension, um, uh, again, reflecting a right heart uh, stress that is not present in the healthy population. And the big red flag, I mean, really one that um, I think if I were to teach a medical student who's saying, this is so rare, how am I going to recognize it? Well, somebody who faints during exercise until proven otherwise has heart disease or pulmonary hypertension. That's just like you know, if you hear about somebody who says, I'm fine, but every time I run, I get dizzy and I'm even fainted when I'm running, then that's a big, big red flag for either this diagnosis or another form of important heart disease that you've probably already talked about during these webinars. Now, as they get uh, farther down the course of their pulmonary hypertension, secondary anatomic changes occur, the pulmonary arteries get dilated, they may compress um, adjacent important cardiac structures like a coronary artery, so you might get some exertional ischemic kind of, anginal kind of chest pain. And believe it or not, the left red, uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve is nearby where the pulmonary arteries are dilating, and you can even get some bizarre changes in voice. And, uh, and of course, this is a late finding. Hopefully, they would have um, been picked up well before this. Um, so, uh, now, just like there's a World Health Organization category for pretty much everything, there's also a functional classification separate from the NYHA functional class. It kind of is very similar. It's taken from similar principles. Uh, just suffice it to say the uh, functional class one patient in this uh, scheme um, has 
really no resting limitations. Um, and and when they do ordinary daily activities, they're going to work, they're taking care of their kids, uh, things are cool. Maybe when they go to their CrossFit class, they fall behind, but they're pretty healthy. Uh, and this is the earliest stage of symptom detection you might uh, hope to find your patients in and where there's a better um, prognosis during pregnancy. Uh, as they get a little bit more limited, class two, and then uh, at, you know, uh, someone who's comfortable at rest, but just getting up to cross the room to get a cup of coffee or walk out to their mailbox, class three symptoms. And then those that really are just uncomfortable pretty much all the time, um, they're, they're symptomatic at rest, class four. So very similar paradigm to the New York functional class, New York Heart Association functional class for heart failure. Okay. Uh, moving on to the physical uh, signs of heart failure you might want to hunt for, I mean, a pulmonary hypertension you might want to hunt for. Um, clearly, if they have congenital heart disease and, and a septal defect in association with pulmonary hypertension, they might be cyanotic and, and or clubbed or both. Uh, heart murmurs uh, should clue you into either a congenital heart possibility or acquired valvular regurgitation, either pulmonary or tricuspid valve regurgitation, you know, very characteristic heart murmurs uh, um, in both situations. Um, and then the uh, uh, peripheral signs. Uh, sometimes the uh, clubbing is uh, is subtle. Um, sometimes I ask, uh, you know, when, when teaching, I'll, I'll, I'll say you know, to the student or the young doctor or nurse, I'll say, put your hand up next to theirs and look at the angle on the uh, nail beds. And if, if yours doesn't look like theirs, start wondering why. I mean, there are reasons to be clubbed that aren't due to anything with pulmonary hypertension or congenital heart disease, but uh, obviously it's not a common finding. It should be you know, followed up on. Um, uh, other symptoms, uh, excuse me, other signs are going to be in the um, domain of heart failure. Uh, right ventricular uh, failure may present with peripheral edema, ascites, uh, hepatomegaly, distended neck veins, you know, blood just not getting into the right heart chambers. And then um, when the right ventricular uh, systolic function and um, filling is significantly diminished, then cardiac output goes down. You can't get blood through the pulmonary circulation. If you can't get it through the circulation, uh, through the pulmonary circulation, and there are no pop-offs, no holes in the heart to fill those left heart chambers, you're going to be in low cardiac output, signs of shock. So dizziness, pallor, cool extremities, poor capillary refill. So that's sort of the extreme. Hopefully we won't see too many patients like that. Okay. Shifting to another office-based test, it's pretty easy to do, an EKG. You can see the pattern here. It's all right-sided stuff. So um, large P waves, not wide P waves, but large amplitude P waves lasting, um, uh, are, you know, being at least three millimeters wide, actually three millimeters high, something, you know, typically um, uh, very obvious. Uh, tall P waves in the uh, right uh, in the uh, um, right precordial leads and the limb leads, uh, very diagnostic of uh, probably a right atrial enlargement. Uh, right axis deviation, RVH criteria, even bundle branch block can occur. And then you start to see some unusual T-wave patterns too when the heart, right ventricle is really under strain. And, and not everybody with a prolonged QT interval has a genetic long QT syndrome. These uh, right ventricles that are sick will secondarily have abnormal lengthy repolarization times leading, leading to a prolonged QT. Doesn't mean it's, un, you know, it's any safer than the genetic long QT syndromes though. They can still have ventricular arrhythmias uh, superimposed on that substrate. All right, and then if you went in a little further in the office and you said, okay, I'm getting my ears up toward the possibility of something going on with the, uh, the lungs and heart, maybe pulmonary hypertension, a chest x-ray, totally legit to order, looking for enlargement of the right heart chambers, unusual findings, the way the pulmonary arteries look, the, the radiologist, you might often see radiology reports say, the pulmonary artery is dilated, suspect pulmonary hypertension. Well, that's exactly what they're hunting for. Um, and then when you look at the pulmonary arteries as they finally taper toward the peripheral lung fields, they typically get smaller and smaller until they just kind of disappear over the outer third of the, um, the lung margins. Uh, in the pulmonary hypertension patient, especially those with congenital heart disease, for example, they kind of just truncate. They, they're, they're big centrally, and then they're gone. They, they don't have this taper like typical. So keep an eye out for that kind of stuff. And then, of course, lung disease. You've probably seen people with hyperinflated lungs from emphysema and, uh, and other fibrotic uh, changes in the lungs. So, so those are all uh, le totally legit ways to kind of get your ears up toward the possibility of pulmonary hypertension with simple uh, diagnostic studies are ordered in the office. Okay, now we've moved on from your suspicion to 
you you say, okay, we got to look into this. So um, the first test, as talked about earlier, is an echocardiogram. Um, and you can see all the pictures on this uh, complex diagram. They're, they have one thing in common. The right heart chambers are big. And uh, and that, you know, it just really needs to be hammered home to all of our sonographer, sonographers and cardiologists that um, that they probably know that if a right heart chamber is big, there's a high probability that there is pathology downstream in the pulmonary arteries. Now, it could be that the right heart chambers are big due to valvular disease, like, you know, a leaky pulmonary valve or tricuspid valve or an abnormal um, pulmonary artery, pulmonary venous connection going instead of left atrium going to the right side of the chambers. But that's not common. This is more common. So when you see the right heart chambers big, you also see evidence for high velocity tricuspid valve regurgitation, again, you know, indicating the pressures in the right ventricle are high. Probably, not always, but probably when the right ventricle pressures are high, the pulmonary artery pressures are high. Now, I have to say, as a conjunct heart specialist, any of my patients that have high right ventricular pressures until proven otherwise, they have pulmonary stenosis and they may have perfectly normal downstream, downstream pulmonary pressure. So just because the tricuspid valve velocity of regurgitation is high, you'll never see at least a congenital cardiologist say that defines pulmonary hypertension, that defines right ventricular hypertension with a probability that it's also in the pulmonary arteries. So just a little point of clarification there. All right. So now, uh, after you've got your findings of high velocity tricuspid valve regurgitation, where is the cutoff? Where are we going to start as cardiologists to say it's time to start looking for pulmonary hypertension in a more refined manner? So the pulmonary, uh, you know, the right ventricular pressure that drives at a velocity less than 2.8 meters per second backwards across the tricuspid valve, probably in the normal range of right ventricular and pulmonary pressures, low probability. If it's more than almost three and a half, high probability pulmonary hypertension and then everything in between is kind of intermediate needs a little bit closer attention so you look for risk factors but uh, you know if i if i were to say um, what does a, a you know a, an echo report look like with significant pulmonary hypertension look for the tricuspid valve regurgitation velocity and if it's more than three and a half meters per second there unless they've got pulmonary stenosis or pulmonary artery stenosis you've got a patient with pulmonary hypertension at a high probability now what else are you going to do well, uh, you go on a hunt for cause. So anything other than congenital heart disease, pretty much you got to go hunting for if they don't have an obvious birth defect of their heart. So um, now with uh, any patient that has chronic hypoxemia, they may have an eryth erythrocytosis. So red cell mass is going to increase secondarily to the chronic hypoxemia, so a CBC. More advanced disease in the pulmonary arteries um, traps platelets, so they may be thrombocytopenic. Um, electrolytes, you're mainly looking to see if, um, you know, they're safe uh, with respect to potassium for any diuretic therapies that you might want to prescribe and creatinine and calculated GFR to see if you can push those if they need diuretic therapy um, in the face of chronic kidney disease. Uh, those that have high erythrocyte mass will often have a high serum uric acid, maybe not to the level of causing gout, but could be. Um, and those that have uh, chronic right heart hypertension and pulmonary hypertension is the cause will have uh, hepatic uh, changes as well, congestive hepatopathy. So you'll see some abnormalities on the serum biochemistries related to liver, uh, uh, both synthetic as well as non-synthetic function. Um, and then uh, I always, you know, especially in the people that have high hemoglobin levels, even though the MCV is listed in the CBC in that patient with a high hemoglobin to be normal, it may not be normal enough in the sense that it may still have a vulnerability to relative iron deficiency. So I always include iron store studies in people that have erythrocytosis, even if their MCV is normal. And then finally, you're looking for some biomarkers of heart failure with either the BNP or NT pro BNP. I don't think there's really a major reason to pick one or the other, just get used to using whatever you like. And many of the diseases that are accompanying pulmonary hypertension in the absence of congenital heart disease may also be accompanied by uh, hypothyroidism. So uh, I think that's a reasonable addition. Now, as far as non-congenital um, abnormalities, uh, connective tissue disorders that cause pulmonary hypertension are out there. So look for those. Uh, HIV-related pulmonary hypertension is out there. Um, look for that. You already do pretty much when you're in obstetrical practice. You're screening for hepatitis and HIV routinely anyway. Um, and then the people with uh, systemic sclerosis, I guess scleroderma, the old term, but systemic sclerosis may have some autoantibodies as well that are not just important to your, your management of that patient, uh, but also potentially to their fetus if those antibodies cross the placental circulation and damage the fetal heart. Um, 
you're striking out on all those, don't uh, hesitate to pull the trigger or have your consultant in genetics uh, pull the trigger for pulmonary hypertension associated gene testing. It's out there and it's it's informative. Unfortunately, uh, it reminds me of a sort of a patient uh, uh, scenario. Uh, a colleague of mine would never really understand what a patient had when they left his office. He said, we'll figure it out. And I asked him, don't they ever get mad at you for not knowing what they have? He said, Joel, you know what I do. If I can name it, they don't want it. If you can name the genetic cause for their pulmonary hypertension, they don't want it. It's bad. Um, now, functional testing uh, for congenital patients, heart failure patients, pulmonary hypertension patients, we liberally use cardiopulmonary exercise testing. It simulates the stresses of pregnancy, and it gives us an idea where our vulnerabilities are in terms of how uh, potentially sick they're going to get during the second and third trimesters. And of course, we're going to do heart catheterization to see if there's anything that we can do to um, make them better, uh, usually vasoactive. Uh, drug infusions or uh, inhaled nitric oxide during cardiac catheterization will, for many people, improve the pulmonary vascular resistance enough that um, we can leverage that as a therapeutic option. Now, um, if you don't have anything fancy like that, you just want to do a quick and easy test, then have them walk for six minutes. And if they can walk for uh, more than about 440 meters, uh, you can do the math equivalent for feet, but uh, you know, that's a that's a pretty healthy person. They're usually class one. Um, and uh, and those people typically are going to be the ones that have no biomarkers of heart failure. Uh, they describe themselves as class one, sometimes class two, and, and they're pretty low risk, even though they've got measurable elevations of pulmonary artery pressure. As you get farther out, though, um, you know, the people that can't walk more than a football field and a half in six minutes, uh, that's uh, that's somebody who's, you know, pretty vulnerable to uh, severe consequences during pregnancy. And then lastly, uh, a little bit about therapeutics. You're not going to be responsible as a, a, a obstetrician, a cardiologist that's not specializing in pulmonary hypertension or uh, or any other discipline that's outside the referral center for pulmonary hypertension to, to treat uh, with these drugs. But pulmonary medicine specialists, congenital heart disease consultants, and pulmonary hypertension specialists in general use all avenues of therapy. We've got drugs that attack the endothelin receptors. We've uh, got drugs that vasodilate the pulmonary arteries through the nitric oxide pathway, both you know, sildenafil, tadalafil, and then the, the ones at the bottom there, this GM, uh, the cyclic GMP uh, you know, pathway, which is the um, adempus uh, version. And then prostacycline drugs. These are people, uh, these are drugs that can either be injected, inhaled, continuously infused, um, that sort of thing. So lots of different pathways often used simultaneously uh, to maximize therapeutic benefit. Um, I think I already did that talk, so sorry about that duplicate slide. And here are some of the drugs you'll see on the uh, med reconciliations of our pulmonary hypertension patients. Let's just pick a few. So calcium channel blockers, many of them are used in pregnancy. Nifedipine and lodipine, these are very common. Uh, diltiazem, less common, but you know, th these are the drugs that may be used for a person without congenital heart disease um, and uh, very commonly frontline therapies. Next frontline therapy is um, more common in my population of patients, the uh, phosphodiesterase inhibitors, the you know, sildenafil three times a day or tadalafil once a day. Uh, not the doses for erectile dysfunction, but much smaller. And then um, uh, ERAs, endothelial receptor antagonists. I think most people have shifted toward the ones that are at the bottom here. Um, uh, both sentence seem to have a little bit more benefit for the population with a very severe form of congenital heart disease associated pulmonary hypertension called Eisenmenger syndrome. Uh, others, you know, this is a dual endothelial receptor antagonist therapy called Massitentin or Opsimit. You know, you'll see these more locked likely than the uh, ambrosentin. Not that ambrosentin is bad, it's just that I think practice habits are shifting toward these other two uh, for very specific reasons. Congenital heart disease here, non-congenital here. And then there's all kinds of uh, prostacycline analogs and receptor antagonists. This is an oral medication. Um, nice to add when you're seeing patients not getting better with dual therapy over here. Um, but it has a lot of side effects. And uh, and so uh, I will tell you every time I've prescribed uh, Selexipag, which is a trade name, Oop Travi, um, it's, a, it's a battle sometimes to get them to up titrate because it causes a lot of GI side effects, namely diarrhea. Uh, so uh, so you'll see fewer patients on this drug. And, uh, and these two class right here, Selexipag and the ERAs, these are no-no. 
during pregnancy. Yeah. We can use this class, this class, and this class during pregnancy. So let's get into it. So as you know, you've probably heard and seen similar slides like this over and over again. The patient with pregnancy-related cardiovascular adaptation has many things that mimic disease. Uh, it's always been said that pregnancy mimics heart disease if, uh, uh, if you're really being um, observant. Uh, but uh, I want to point out a couple things that you already know. Um, for example, the placental circulation provides a low resistance uh, outlet to the systemic vascular resistance. So um, people that are hypertensive often need less antihypertensive drug therapy during pregnancy. Well, if you've got a big hole between your uh, right ventricle and your left ventricle, a VSD, and you've got pulmonary hypertension, blood's going to go the path of least resistance. So if your resting saturation before you got pregnant was in the mid 80s to low 90s, and you drop the systemic vascular resistance with drugs or by getting pregnant, you might get really blue, really blue during pregnancy. I mean, significantly hypoxic compared to your uh, pre-pregnancy oxygen saturation. So uh, uh, keep that in mind. And of course, anybody with pulmonary hypertension depends on a decent venous return to kind of charge up the right heart chambers and, and get that e uh, stroke volume um, ejected uh, at, a, at a high filling pressure uh, oftentimes. And if you don't fill the right heart chambers by, for example, the uterine comp uh, compression of IVC um, in certain positions lying flat, you'll hear them talk about it. They'll say, I get really sick feeling whenever I'm lying flat. And they'll say, yeah, well, don't do that. Lie on your left side, you know that. So uh, historical perspective. So I'll give you the background. This dates back to when, you know, uh, uh, when I was a medical student, you know, nobody wanted any of these patients to get pregnant. It was just like, thou shalt not. It was, uh, it was considered to be extremely high risk. Uh, half, half the patients would um, have, more, you know, maternal mortality during um, pregnancy. And the babies were having serious trouble as well because of the, how sick the mothers were. And if they did not, you know, themselves you know, succumb to their disease, they'd have a preterm delivery and all the attendant mortality and morbidity concerns for the fetus. So, so obviously historical perspective is important, but I have to tell you things have changed. Yeah, so, yeah, so when people say, my God, you're advising somebody to uh, stay pregnant during pulmonary, with pulmonary hypertension? Well, it's not exactly that we're encouraging it, but you know, you know the concept of shared decision-making and you should be fair and, and, and as honest about the risk as you can. And so the risk is still high. Don't get me wrong. Nobody should encounter a risk of dying from any disease uh, that approaches one out of four. Um, so uh, I will say that even though it's better, it's still frightening as can be. And many women know this. If you are counseling them as a cardiologist, pulmonologist, obstetrician, a maternal fetal medicine consultant, you're right to tell them, listen, this is not the direction you should take your life. But they come in sometimes pregnant anyway. Uh, and they have unforeseeable risks, so you have to be honest with yourself as well as with them. I can tell you the statistics, but it's really a, a crapshoot sometimes. Some people are very tolerant of pregnancy, and then some aren't. And deterioration come at any time. So just because you had a good checkup this week doesn't mean you're good to go. And pregnancy can accelerate the progress of your disease compared to another person who had the same level of disease burden before pregnancy and never got pregnant. So these are all important if you're going to grow up to be a mom and watch your kid grow up, uh, they need to know that the disease they have could be made inherently worse forever by becoming pregnant. And so that's why most guidelines have, and probably still recommend pulmonary arterial hypertension patients avoid pregnancy. All right, so now where are we at? Well, women with poorly controlled disease, the sickest of the sick, the class three, class four patients, uh, really, if they get pregnant, um, I know it's hard discussion to have, especially now, but it is very dangerous. Um, and I, as a cardiologist, would never uh, sugarcoat that one. They, they really need to be surrounded by people who understand how tough this decision is going to be, provide them with all the emotional uh, support they're going to need to have um, to make a tough decision. But termination is typically the right way to go if you're to save the mother's life. And um, and uh, and that obviously uh, is a is a tough decision. I'm, I'm glad I don't have to have it as often as many of you do. Um, uh, so now I will say though that you know, there's the good cop and the bad cop, and 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 there ought to be somebody in the room when they're not that sick, you know, functional class one patient who's got an abnormal pulmonary artery pressure, not critically elevated, not to the point where they're symptomatic with heart failure or arrhythmias or coughing up blood or anything like that, but you know. 
in reality, they, they have a disease. It's not as advanced. Um, they're now pregnant. It's it's OK to let them voice their concerns and and also their wishes uh, and share that decision as you probably uh, uh, do every single day of your practice. So pulmonary uh, hypertension therapies, like I've talked about already, there are things you can give. So even if they're not on anything, there are still meds that you can give as a consultant in pulmonary hypertension to your patients to mitigate the risk during pregnancy. So prostacycline therapies, uh, uh, phosphodiesterase inhibitors, calcium channel, all legit. So now I would say this, a lot of our patients know they have this and then obviously want to know, what should I do if I want to have a baby? Are you telling me I'm not so bad? I'm hearing you're telling me that I could get real sick, but I'm willing to take that chance. So you really want to switch them off these teratogenic drugs like ERAs and Selexapag and see how they do. If they're stable on the you know, regimen without those drugs, then okay, you know, do all your testing again, right heart cath, exercise tests, blood tests. If they're still stable, okay, you sure you want to get pregnant? Okay. And then they do it. Uh, anticoagulation. Um, this is not an endorsement of anticoagulation for people who aren't pregnant with pulmonary hypertension. That's sort of falling by the wayside. It used to be that almost everybody with pulmonary hypertension got anticoagulated. Now the data are less and sort of less convincing that that's helpful and may actually show harm. But in pregnancy, it's different. Prothrombotic state, um, clearly with some diseases like. Uh, pulmonary hypertension due to the idiopathic or genetic causes, no septal defects, no congenital heart disease, uh, chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, you really need to be anticoagulated. And you can't, you know, you know this, uh, warfarin is problematic during pregnancy, so the heparins are, are your choices. For those that, you know, don't need heparin anticoagulation, don't have one of those two diseases, uh, but, you know, you want to do something to mitigate the risk of prothrombotic uh, complications during pregnancy, low-dose aspirin, probably legit, has some other benefits, as you know, so um, I don't have an objection to that, even if they weren't on it before. Now, this is the key, I think, slide. I mean, if I had to pick one thing to drive home, it is you really got to surround yourself with everybody who wants to engage this patient. And you can't wait to the last minute. It's got to be like when they tell you they're pregnant, you start arraying a team around them. And you just constantly drill your, your, your response to crisis. And if you find a weak link in that crisis response, you address it well before hospitalization for labor and delivery. They should be delivered in a place that can take them all the way to the spectrum of mechanical circulatory assistance. And God forbid you can't get off ECMO, well, you got to be ready to transplant. So, so th that's, that's a tough thing to say in a geographic region that doesn't have access to this. Uh, but that's the ideal world. Now, where that ideal world meets reality, none of us in the ideal world should be pejorative or um, or uh, uh, speak unfairly of the good efforts that others are making if that's the only situation that uh, that is available to that particular patient. Uh, we can we can leverage all of our tools, telemedicine, you know, remote visits, even traveling to other sites as a consultant if we had to. But the ideal situation is to involve a team localized in a tertiary care center or quaternary center that has specialty pulmonary and hypertension care. And you see all the specialists right there. Um, and I'll say that you'll find a lot of the obstetrical community uh, uh, talking to their patients about maybe asking them to plan for a little bit early delivery. It's geographically variable in my experience. I don't uh, know how many obstetricians on the call here today would endorse that plan for you know the high risk pregnancy due to heart disease or pulmonary hypertension, but it's not uncommon to at least start planning for a little bit earlier than uh, a term gestation. Uh, not uh, not universal though. I will say that uh, anybody with a hypertensive right atrium or a hole in their heart could pop off a right to left shunt. And any bubbles that are inadvertently in that IV line or that infusion therapy that you're giving them that get into the right heart will go to the left heart. If they go into the left heart chambers, that's a hop, skip and a jump to the coronary arteries, heart attack, stroke, from the, you know, into the brain. So protect every single IV infusion, except for blood products with a bubble trap or a micron, a 0.2 micron filter. It's almost kind of just the default for people with congenital heart disease. It should be the default for people with pulmonary hypertension. Um, uh, assisted vaginal delivery, as it is with many forms of heart disease, is probably the safest for those that are, that are the healthiest. Uh, there's no doubt that with severe aortopathy and severe heart failure, you're going to go more toward the cesarean section approach, as you should. And the same thing goes here. You know, the class three, class four patients with pulmonary hypertension are probably going to be better 
um, and safer during a planned cesarean section. But that said, um, I will say logistics come into play. It's hard to get everybody together. And even in a big center, to get everybody in the same room or ready to go into the same room at the same time, typically daytime hours. Babies who are being induced don't often come out in daytime hours. So, so for practical considerations, again, no um, uh, you know, recrimination uh, against the, the people that say, yeah, listen, we're gonna, do, we're gonna do this under epidural anesthesia and do a C-section. I know we could have done it by vaginal, but you know, let's get real here. You know, we can't bring all these people at the same time to the same place without this kind of approach. So that's cool. I don't recommend pulmonary catheters mostly. Um, I mean, they're just not gonna add to your gut instincts, your clinical measurements uh, from vital signs, EKG, pulse oximetry. If you wanna put a pulse, uh, a, a art line in to monitor blood gases or blood pressure during labor and delivery, cardiovascular anesthesiologists, cardio, uh, obstetrical anesthesiologists often want that. I wouldn't stand in the way. Postpartum care. So uh, as you know, bleeding after uh, delivery is an important problem and uh, and oxytocin is a good way to get rid of that uh, or mi mitigate that risk, but it has uh, a, a propensity for pr provoking pulmonary hypertensive crisis if you infused the routine way. So low and slow uh, when it goes to oxytocin and even intrauterine injections sometimes may be preferred than uh, over IV. And then there's some meds that really I think the uh, uh, obstetrical community, community knows this already, and uh, OB anesthesia knows this, that are really dangerous to provoking pulmonary vasoconstriction like ergotamine and other prostaglandin analogs. So, um, so really steer clear of those if possible. Um, and when you're kind of prepping for your, your, your highest level of apprehension about what could happen, it, as with most things cardiac, uh, it's the first few days after delivery. Um, they get through labor and delivery, second trimester labor and delivery, you're not off the hook yet. Uh, that mobilization of uh, tissue fluid that's been out there before the IVC has been uh, lifted from its uh, compressing uh, uterus, uh, uh, it's all going to come into the circulation. And, uh, and like a bolus of IV fluid, if that right ventricle is vulnerable but compensated before that, it may be decompensated after that. So, uh, and obviously if they get anemic, their oxygen from bleeding and so on after delivery, uh, their oxygen carrying capacity goes down. If they're cyanotic, uh, an anemia, even a, even a normal hemoglobin for a woman whose SAT is typically on a good day, 85%, a normal hemoglobin could provoke a stroke due to ischemic uh, brain injury. So uh, anemia is a big, big risk for provoking pulmonary hypertensive crisis and in the Eisenmenger or congenital heart patient population, uh, stroke. Uh, not due to embolic stroke, but ischemic stroke due to um, uh, hypoxemia and poor oxygen carry capacity. Um, resume your anticoagulation early if they are especially in bed, like you always probably do anyway. Um, and if they were previously on anticoagulation, once the surgical hemostasis is uh, and, and or obstetrical hemostasis is assured, uh, to the best of your ability at least, uh, then get them back on anticoagulation at the higher intensity. And then all the drugs that were stopped prior to pregnancy can now be reintroduced uh, and should be, including ERAs. And if they were on Uptravi or Selexabag, that one too. And certainly, um, you know, going to ask them, you know, what's your intention with respect to feeding your baby? You have to be honest, though, that you're, you're dealing with a small, largely unstudied population with drugs that are even less commonly used than other drugs in uh, breastfeeding mothers. There's not a lot of data, anecdotes. So again, a, char a shared decision-making strategy with whether or not you're going to endorse a plan to breastfeed. How much hazard do you want to take with your baby? And, 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 and I'll just tell you as a pediatric cardiologist, before I became an adult congenital cardiologist, all of these drugs are given to children as well, but they have disease. So to give it to a healthy child is, if there is a transmission in the breast milk, it's, it's not necessarily benign. Okay, one last uh, bit about the pregnancy and contraception now. Um, uh, almost everything is legit. You have to be careful with those that have thromboembolic pulmonary you know, hypertension, uh, giving them estrogenic hormonal therapies. Of course, I think you know that as well. Um, uh, and then there's one particular interaction with some of the uh, hormonal contraceptives, Bocentin. Bocentin has been known to reduce the efficacy of contraception. So uh, what we tell our patients is never rely on one method of contraception anyway, you know, have a barrier method for the guy and have a 
another method, either a long-acting reversible method for the woman or uh, hormonal therapy, uh, or a, at least an IUD. So, um, so all those things uh, are important postpartum. Don't want to go down this road again if you dodged a bullet the first time. Um, okay, so here's our patient. We're almost to the end. Um, remember her, she's 30 years old, large VSD, unrepaired. Don't, you know, don't judge. You maybe never had access to healthcare. Uh, uh, and now she's pregnant. Um, so she wants your advice. So here are the questions. What tools would your expert pulmonary hypertension referral center multidisciplinary team use to assess her adaptation to this pregnancy during the first trimester and inform her prognosis? So what tools uh, among all those things we've talked about? Uh, it's not a trick question. Uh, so it's like you can put it in the chat, um, think about it, yell it out loud, whatever you want. But, um, you know, think about it for a second and then we'll move on and I'll tell you a little bit about, uh, you know, what I'm sure you got right. So uh, these are just common clinical tools to sort of survey the land of what you're about to get yourself and her into. OK, so here's what you've done. You probably asked for all the tests I've listed. So EKG at ECHO, some blood work, maybe a walk distance test to see if she's got all the functional capacity she should. And if she hasn't had a right heart cath to confirm all this concern, she probably ought to have one. Um, I mean, you don't have to use a lot of radiation exposure to float a catheter into the pulmonary arteries. So, uh, so you do all that and look at what you get. You get a normal looking EKG or at least one in the sinus rhythm. Her echo confirms that she has what she says she has, a large VSD. It's right to left shunning, and that accounts for her saturation being low. All things else, expected. Hemoglobin is higher than it should be, but that's because she's got a lower than expected hemoglobin. I mean, a saturation, so she needs more oxygen carrying capacity. MCV is cool, but you're still probably going to do some iron studies. Platelets aren't being sequestered. They're nice and normal. Kidney function is good. No HIV. Um, so what? now that you've got that, remember, she's got pulmonary hypertension. She's got large VSD. She's blue. Um, what advice would you give her at this point, now that you know what you're dealing with? Would you say, ah, we got your back. Let's go ahead. MFM, your turn. Tag, you're it. Or you know, does the general obstetrician say, I heard that this is pretty risky. <laughs> and I have to have a talk now with you. Uh, and I think that's what you've got to do. You've got to have a talk. And, and this pregnancy is very high risk compared to many things that you've probably talked about during this webinar series. This is way up there. And it can, rely, it can be life-changing. Uh, and I mean permanently life-changing. If they don't die, it could really um, hurt them, uh, including accelerating their disease, therefore shortening their lifespan. And uh, and you have to be clear that the risks as we see them uh, in epidemiologically can be as high as 25% uh, maternal mortality. So pregnant pause in the discussion, she thinks things over, maybe goes home and comes back and says, you know what, I thought about it and I really want this baby. And you say, without being judgmental, without displaying the, uh, the, the fear in your uh, heart, <laughs> you say, we got your back. Now let's get on to taking care of safeguarding you as best we can. So your multidisciplinary team is going to do some things next. Uh, if you're you know, doing this webinar, I know you're probably doing these things already, but you're going to gather the troops. So you're going to have this woman meet with everybody. MFM, neonatology, ACHD, obstetric anesthesia, critical care, CT surgery, Everybody that might be called to rescue her at a crisis needs to know her before the final moments of the labor and delivery H and P being written and the orders being you know to the hospital. It's okay to start her on aspirin if you want to do that, and you should think about congenital heart disease being heritable, so you get a fetal echo. Um, unfortunately, things she starts to get sick. You know, about 36 weeks into the pregnancy, having made it through the toughest time, perhaps now she's starting to get sick. She's dysnic at rest now, class two at least, class three probably. Uh, edematous beyond the usual leg edema of pregnancy. Not hypertensive. Doesn't look like it's a preeclampsia scenario. Um, and her stats are starting to drift. You know, she may be anemic. The regular anemia that's uh, the lower uh, hemodilution effects of pregnancy. The, the, you know, the fact that maybe she's just getting an anemia of chronic disease now provoked by the disease of pregnancy, if you will. Um, her BNP is a biomarker that deserves your attention. Don't ever ignore a, a rising BNP when the baseline is normal. So it's time. Baby needs to come out. Um, think about now uh, how your team is going to deliver that baby in your facility with all those players in mind that you've just had her meet with. 
uh, think about the obstetrical anesthesia um, needs and uh, and how are you going to where how and where are you going to monitor her recovery? Again, probably we're going to nail this one too. So you assess her to be worsening and everybody agrees. You've had a meeting. You don't just assume they agree. You say, listen, I need you to tell me you're ready to go, meaning CT surgery. Do we have a room where if you've got to go on ECMO, we can go on ECMO? Uh, anesthesia, do you think you need a cardiac anesthesiologist in addition to your expertise in obstetrical anesthesia? You get everybody to thumbs up their plan. Once they've done that, you have to decide, are you gonna let her labor and deliver? the vaginal delivery. She, remember, she's class one when you first met her. She's not now. <laughs> are you going to go for a C-section? I, I think most of us would probably favor a C-section. She's getting sicker. Uh, and, and logistically, it's just hard to get everybody together. And even now, she's getting sicker. You don't want to kind of uh, give her a stress test that has an indefinite time on the treadmill, so to speak. So you get all her lines protected with bubble filters. Thank God. Uh, excellent obstetrical care. She gets an uneventful C-section. Baby's fine. Now you put her in the ICU, not the general postpartum unit, but you put her in the ICU where everybody is focused on circulatory instability as their primary uh, focus in life, at least for a couple of days, maybe longer. And while you're doing all that, you just like rock. I'm just saying, you guys rocked. This is this is why I like working with you. Yeah, so I'll buy you a drink. So that's that's the outcome. It's always going to be happy like this, right? Uh, we can only hope. So I appreciate you asking me to talk. I appreciate for uh, you know for you know, Iris for you inviting me, and uh, look forward to meeting you guys face to face. That's Thank all I've got. That was excellent. Um, I really enjoyed it. you. You know, well, first of all, I didn't know there was an update in the guidelines, so I'm going to go pull that document after okay. we, after this. Um, I have a few questions for you, but I wanted to give um, you know anyone else the opportunity to ask questions first. Um, about um, ask Joel any questions. So do we have anyone please unmute yourself and, and ask Joel um, your question? We got a chat message, excellent presentation. Anything else? Okay, let's see, I don't see anything else, okay. So Joel, thank you so much for highlighting the multidisciplinary team. I cannot speak enough to you having to have all of these experts and having to come together and the level of coordination that requires to take care of these patients. And so, you know, um, you talked about regional differences. Yes, we typically deliver our patients between 34 to 36 weeks, mainly because of the level of coordination of care and because most of them, you know, just like your case, start decompensating, you know, around 36 weeks. So we want to anticipate and don't want them, you know, to deliver when they're decompensating. Um, my question to you has to deal with some of the medications, and this might be more of a reflection of what ends up coming to me, but I don't have a whole lot of experience with the oral medications. You know, everything we've done is that ibuprostenol where, that requires special nursing skill. You know, um, for us, when we've had these patients, we've had to have one dedicated nurse just for that medication. Wow. And you have your LND nurse and then your ICU nurse. So they may have like three dedicated nurses. And so, you know, one question being like, you know, how do you decide between oral and these, you know, these medications? And then, you know, um, as, if you are using the oral medications, you know, um, are you continuing those during labor and delivery? Like, is there any indication to stop those types of questions? Yeah, great question. So, yeah, so we'll start with, you know, my population, the congenital heart patients. Mm -hmm. So because they have congenital heart disease, we typically don't refer them to another specialist in pulmonary hypertension. Now that's not always the case, but many adult congenital cardiologists also feel it's their obligation to stay spun up on this uh, uh, in this domain. And so we, we manage the pulmonary hypertension without another person, without somebody, frankly, who's prone to using those IV drugs. <laughs> and so, um, and we're dealing with young people. So whether it's intentional or maybe we've just kind of subconsciously gotten uh, fear feared the the possible need to hospitalize a patient of either sex uh, in an unfamiliar hospital that doesn't have the expertise to manage these drugs you'll never almost never see a congenital heart specialist start with an IV drug or add an IV drug in this age group the reproductive age group now and that's not to say those without congenital heart disease don't get on these drugs so people with idiopathic or genetic forms of pulmonary hypertension not managed by us managed by 
specialty pulmonary hypertension services, they're very sick. They don't have a pop off. They have no way out of their right heart. So they need every drug, the highest potency drugs, and they're the more likely patient to be on those IV infusions. The only thing I can say is if you think they might be considering pregnancy, sort of the preconception counseling concept, is say, I'm going to ask your pulmonary hypertension doc if they can maybe trial you off these therapies to see if it's safe and substitute something else that might be suboptimal during the long term, but satisfactory enough during pregnancy. Great, thank you. Um, I have, um, let's see, there's a comment here. Let me try to pull it up. Or uh, Dr. Bird, are you on? Would you like to? Uh... Here, I didn't know if you guys would be able to hear me. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Uh, we can hear you now, yeah. So, yeah, so I um, had attended a cardiopsychiatrist conference. From what I heard um, with pulmonary artery hypertension, they recommended avoiding cesarean section as as much as possible just because of the larger fluid volumes and the potential fluid shifts postpartum. And they also spoke to, um, I think it was Dr. Zwicky um, in, I think she's in Wisconsin, but she also spoke to like an aggressive diuresis postpartum. Would you agree? that they, you know, with those two sentiments as well, or? Yeah, I think, uh, I, I think uh, again, clearly uh, for people with heart failure and for uh, class one or class two pulmonary hypertension, uh, the hemodynamic uh, alterations uh, that are induced by the process of having a baby are less with a vaginal delivery. Uh, class three, class four patients, you know, heart failure that's nearly decompensated, um, uh, I think you kind of have to shift the needle a little bit the other way. So I wouldn't say um, uh, that you never uh, want to do a C-section, just like I wouldn't say you always want it. I just, you know, the, the healthier population going into labor and delivery admission, more inclined to allow them a trial of labor. Uh, but you, 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 again, I think you have to be honest with yourself and your team, say, okay, you know, I got it. This is what we want to have happen. We want to have this woman, um, naturally delivered because it's the lowest risk in you know, vaginal delivery with assisted second stage. Um, are we ready if the induction of labor uh, brings that baby at three in the morning yeah. to get her where she needs to go for all these people to be in there? If you got that drilled and you've drilled it, you say, listen, I told you it could happen at three in the morning. Come on in. ECMO, <laughs> CV surgery, cardiac anesthesia, <laughs> cardiac uh, adult congenital heart doctor who, by the way, there's only like one of you. <laughs> Let's do it because uh, you promised you'd be ready, you know, then. Yeah. But I mean, you have to be honest sometimes that you just it, 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 the safer course of action is the one that has the most backstops, uh, not the one that is on a symposium lecture, the most ideal. So and then diuretics. Absolutely. If they're if they're if they're uh, in florid heart failure, clearly just make et cetera, et cetera. You're going to use diuretics. I got to be careful. Drop that preload on a hypertensive right ventricle with no pop-off, you can provoke cardiogenic shock. So diuretic therapy for heart failure, yes. Dyspnea, yes. But for just, uh, you know, somebody who it routinely administers diuretics because they've got pulmonary hypertension, I, I don't think we do routine anything because of a diagnosis. We always reassess. Dr. Bird, to, um, you know, add on to what um, Joel said, the other you know, at least, you know, every institution varies just like you and, you know, Joel said, like you have to be realistic about whether you can get some of these services to come in at like three in the morning. I think one other hiccup like with our institution is, um, you know, if you are going to induce someone, um, you know, we have a conversation with the patient about not being able to offer a stat C-section. And mainly, you know, you try to get an early epidural in, but if you end up having to put them under general and it's, you know, in this quick scenario, that could be dangerous. And so then, you know, you're having a conversation with a patient about, you know, you have this term baby, but we may not be able to run and get this baby out if there's something, you know, like if there's a terminal bradycardia. So that's another thing that I know that comes up a lot when we are in these teams talking to these patients of, regarding mode of delivery. Joel, um, Carolyn had to run away, but she did have a question. So she texted it to me and wanted me to ask you. <laughs> um, so her question was, um, 
you know, what kind of recommendations would you give a provider who is not in a coordinary center um, to stabilize a patient who comes in acutely before you transfer them to that higher level center? Great question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think uh, 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 when I was doing my other world outside of civilian life, the, the, the mantra was in a, in a crisis, IV O2 monitor. So IV access, but remember, air filter. Uh, oxygen, no harm at all in giving high, you know, high flow oxygen, um, even if they got a normal set. Um, uh, monitor by telemetry and, and continuously for arrhythmias. Um, and then gather all the requisite uh, laboratory database to help facilitate rapid decisions by your consultants elsewhere. So, um, you know, BNPs and and uh, and um, uh, biochemistry, kidney function, et cetera. Uh, look for uh, problems with uh, hemoglobin being lower than it was last time you checked. Uh, and then uh, IV fluid bolus is a is a safe bet in somebody who has got um, tachycardia, a shortness of breath, and a pretty clear chest X-ray. You know, um, and remember, uh, you know, pulmonary embolism rears its ugly head in this population too. So dyspnea. Um, uh, that you think, you know, man, I, I, I got to be thinking PE, um, then do think PE, get that worked out. And, uh, um, <laughs> you know, it, it really uh, do everything you normally do for a woman without pulmonary hypertension who might be in heart failure, um, but be, be, be ready to also administer um, you know, uh, IV fluid bolus therapy. Inotropes don't have much of a role here, unfortunately. I don't think I could say that that's a good way to get them ready. Um, if you do have the ability to give nitric oxide, uh, that that is sometimes available, um, even in you know outside of quaternary centers, you can give it by nasal cannula. Um, uh, so it's it, you know we're in a different world now. Nitric oxide used to be kind of just the the exotic drug that only a few people had. Now, now more people have it. So uh, lots of you know good question. Um, and then clearly a, a rapid uh, consultation with the specialist, uh, so we can you know help you through the analysis as well. Um, I have one last question, and mm -hmm. it was in reference to the anemia. You mentioned that you don't want these patients to be anemic, and your case had a hemoglobin of 19, I think is, it was. Mm -hmm. So what level would you consider to be anemic in this patient population with this physiology? Yeah, I think um, uh, relative to their baseline hemoglobin, if you have it, um, uh, if if they are, you know, you know, uh, uh, even a, a hemoglobin of 14 <laughs> might well, so be. That's what I'm uh, thinking. That for yeah, them, that's yeah. anemia because yeah. we, we typically yeah. deal with anemia of pregnancy and the, yeah. you know, dilutional yeah. anemia. So I'm trying to like process, yeah. like, yeah. what do we, we do we, in anticipation of delivery uh, yeah. to make yeah, sure but, that they don't yeah. have this, you know, well, you problem. have to have you, you have to have a low threshold for replacing red cells. The lower the oxygen saturation is on arrival. I mean, the, this is the Isaminger patient. We're not talking yeah. about the non Isaminger pH yeah. patient. They 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 got to have a normal hemoglobin usually. Uh, but the Isaminger patient, you, uh, it's it's tragic. But you know, a lot of them um, when they when they drop four or five grams acutely from either hemorrhage or um, uh, other reasons, they uh, they tend to um, you know they get very tachycardic. They get very blue. Uh, and they um, and th they have had strokes uh, with an acute change in hemoglobin of that magnitude, four or five grams. So uh, uh, it's hard to say that there's a threshold for transfusion at 14, but boy, you really should start. Wow, we're going to intensify our frequency of monitoring hemoglobin now. We're going to go every six hours or eight hours or whatever. Uh, and and it, and there's no wrong answer. So this, again, I, I hate to you know uh, you know say that I, I just you know when you get that um, uh, that level of uh, this patient's not moving in the right direction. They're, they're, they look sicker, and their hemoglobin's the only thing I can see changing. Um, I have control over that. Uh, then you're going to have to talk to your blood bank, uh, you know, transfusion quality assurance team and say, listen, chill out on this one, okay? This is not the average seven to eight transfusion threshold. Got it, got it. Well, this was wonderful. We got a lot of comments in the section, you know, outstanding presentation, wonderful presentation. So we really appreciate you coming and uh, giving us this lecture. Thank you. Great. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Hardin. That was wonderful. And thanks everyone for joining today. I know we went a little bit over, but again, this um, presentation will be up on our website and also on MS Teams. Um, so I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day and thanks again for attending. Thank you. Thank you.